Bring us in, Pritchett. Greetings and welcome to Trinity Radio. <laughs> I'm Jonathan Pritchett, and along with me is Braxton Hunter. And today we have a chart for the first time. We're going to be talking about where atheists and Christians, depending on the kind of Christian and atheist you are, agree, and where they disagree, and who can agree with one another, and who can't agree with one another. And most yeah. of this revolves around uh, epistemology. Yeah. So. That's kind of what this is all about, just to give you a preview of what we're talking about if you were looking at the thumb and wondering. Yeah, so basically what... So I'm going to go through an article a little bit and talk a little bit about that, but here's... Did you link the article in the... I will link the article in the description. Okay. I should have already done that. Um, <clears throat> but basically what, what we have come to discover, and Jonathan gave a lecture a couple of times over the past year where he laid out something similar to this. And I kind of had an epiphany uh, this morning about this. And then Jonathan was like, yeah, duh. That's what I talked about at this conference. Right. So and you so can I actually said, watch that conference on this channel. It's my, it's my presentation at the unapologetics conference in Chandler, Texas, I think at uh, right at Crandall, Texas. That's right. Um, Crandall. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. Yeah. Crandall. Yep. Crandall. Yep. What I say Chandler. Yeah. Okay. But in any case, uh, so here's the thing. And, and of course there's a part of, there's a, the main aspect of this. It's like, yeah, of course we know that, but we need to realize it in a better way. I think. Yeah. So it's not that we have, this is how I'm going to say it. It's not that we have Christians over here and atheists over there. We have Christians and atheists who privilege objective truth over here and Christians and atheists who make that, who make truth, not the priority but a second order issue over there. Yes. Um, and this is confused by the fact that everyone on all sides says that they're all about science and everything. Yeah. Now they might, which, which is underwritten by objective truth or on social issues. You can find all kinds of people who may agree on this particular issue or that particular issue, but, but, but they do so for ver very different reasons. It all goes back to epistemology. And of course, uh, we can set this up by talking about how um, if you would have asked me and a lot of Christian apologists uh, 10, 12 years ago, whether or not, well, oh, hi, Sarah Hunter. You would <laughs> It says Sarah Hunter, but I think it's my sweet little daughter. All right. Well, hi, Jolie. Or, no, it's not Jolie. It's Jacqueline. I wasn't going to name, but it's okay. I'll name her. Okay. Jacqueline. Hey, Jacqueline. Or Sarah. Could be Sarah. In which case, N Noah sup, jumps babe? on here from time to time. I don't have a problem yeah. telling people. Oh, that's my son Noah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so if you would have asked me, and maybe even a lot of apologists, uh, mm -hmm. 10, 12 years ago, if uh, postmodernism was still a, a, a dominant thing, and we would have been like, no, not really, more of a, just a dumb relativism that we've always had. But the emergent church represented the, the dying gasps of, of postmodernism anywhere in culture. And then all of a sudden we found out that the science departments gave way to the social science and humanities departments in secular universities and having hitched its wagon to various critical and literary theories, postmodernism is back alive and well and dominating the culture right now in terms of the way people are thinking about things. And you can, you can discover this by trying to actually reason with certain people. And no matter how many facts you present that you think represent the world and, and you can cooperate with evidence, uh, 
Uh, it doesn't matter if, if your facts are inconvenient to certain cultural narratives that people want to promote, uh, then uh, objective truth doesn't matter. Narrative right. with this postmodernist uh, worldview that seems to have sank in at a popular level is really what is prioritized. And that goes back to different things about, about all truth is just claims to power and buying for power and all that. So that's kind of how we've set this up, which is why if you, I, I could say in my presentation that Michael Shermer lamenting the state of science agrees with Christians and people like Michael Jones, who he debated mm -hmm. about at least in principle, objective truth, even if they disagree what that objective truth is, That's they right. at least agree in principle and, and that there is objective truth. And you'll truth. understand more when, when we look yeah. at the article. But real quick, I want to say, uh, hey, Edward Orlando, cool name, by the way. Um, uh, there's more to your name than that. But anyway, hey, hey guys, I just finished your apologetics and mass communication class. Please be cool with my homework and grades. Hey, you know, that's the one we teach together, isn't it, Jonathan? Yes. I thought so. Well, we're glad you're here, Edward. So glad that you made it. All right, so let's take a look at this article. I'm going to link it in the description, but if you want to look it up right now, you can... Oh, no. Did I close it out? Dadgummit. Talk about something for a second, Pritchett. Yeah, well, you know, I, I was thinking I, I've been making... Uh, my, my Twitter feed has become just a steady stream of, of, of jokes. No, no harm intended. I, I make jokes on Twitter and Facebook or whatever, but uh, I was, I, I've been making jokes about... We had the Southern Baptist Convention's national... Uh, annual the, the annual meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention in Anaheim uh, this past week, and there was a lot of interesting things that and developments that came out of that. Most notably, and what we should all celebrate, is the fact that they voted to to start uh, the process of, of serious reforms when it comes to how the Southern Baptist Convention and its partnering churches will handle the issues of sex abuse. So that was that was good news. Um, and then, of okay. course, there's a lot of hemming and hawing yeah. about this faction. Rick Warren's still chapter. Southern Baptist. Yeah. His church For, now. For now. For now. All right. Let's get back into the article here. I found it. It's from a, a publication called The Critic. And the author is Sebastian Milbank. This was from June 15th of this year. And I don't know anything about The Critic, except it looks like it's a British cons conservative leaning. Or I, Hey, it may be really conservative. I don't know. It may not be conservative at all. I know that Peter Hitchens uh, contributes and things like that. Well, so. conservative in the UK is a lot different. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> than what we would say. But. All right. So the name of the article is The Strange Afterlife of New Atheism. For those who don't know, new well, the article will describe that. The once dominant internet and media phenomenon has given way to more agile secularism, but its legacy lives on. Secularisms. What yeah. What do the terms biological reality and objective truth conjure for you? Or how about freedom of speech and complaints about orthodoxy, suppressing scientific inquiry? In current political debates, you're likely to think of the never-ending trans controversies or right-wingers complaining about the lack of free speech in workplaces and university campuses. In other words, they're now conservative coded terms. And if you hear someone using them, you can make educated guesses about the rest of their beliefs. But not very long ago, this sort of language was deployed not by the right, but the left in arguments about climate change and the reality of Darwinian evolution in the early 2000s being progressive meant being pro-science, pro-objectivity pro and pro-materialism. So what I want you to notice here is the shift that they're, they're saying like, well, we're going to get to the shift, but new atheism, what came to be known as new atheism, one of the things was, it was, no man, what is the fact of the matter? Yeah. What's the truth? What's the objective truth? And science, which is underwritten by objective truth, is is our favorite tool. It's the thing. Yes. And so that has begun to change, according to the guy writing this. The great battles, we were told, were between moderate rational liberals who just wanted to agree on objectively observable facts. We knew how old the earth was, and it wasn't created 8,000 years ago. We knew the climate cha was changing and that humans were causing it. It was wild-eyed religious conservatives who put ideology before observable reality. But insisting too hard on the importance of genetics today gets you drummed out of academic institutions by the left, by the left, not the right. That's right. 
Not that the left was wholly given up on. Now, I'm not just, I mean, I am reading this, but we are, it's setting up for something that's going to be a good payoff, I think. Not that the left has wholly given up on the imprimatur of scientific authority. You will find scientific expertise wielded on behalf of the climate or trans rights or drug policy on a regular basis. But there has been a clear rhetorical and conceptual shift where once the left stood for cool headed rationalism, taking the emotion out of how we punish criminals or policy or police drugs and asking what works. It now embraces an ideology of care. Peer-reviewed papers are as likely to take on board the lived experiences of victims and indigenous ways of knowing as they are data-driven approaches. Environmental policy is less two minutes to midnight on the doomsday clock than it is, how do I lower my carbon emissions as a vegan who like holidays in Thailand? <laughs> the, softening of the, left has that, <laughs> the, the softening of the left has precipitated a major break with what was once dominant internet media published phenomenon, not to mention an influential social movement, new atheism. In the 2000s, it was in the triumphant, uh, uh, triumphant ascendant, uh, uh, firmly identifying with the center and the left of politics against a backdrop of Islamist terrorists, uh, groups, a tipping point of declining religious belief in the West and widespread climate change denial among the political right. Conditions were perfect for a stu uh, strident and militant anti-religious movement. So, so we've talked, so now the, he's talking about how this is, we knew what this was. People recognized new atheism, even who weren't interested in right. worldview discussions. Online atheism, well, here he says, online atheism is a familiar phenomenon to almost anyone active on the web during this period. Would be internet, uh, would be, let's see. Well, would be internet, just, yeah, would he be just, internet. He yeah. goes on from there. Yeah. Anyone who had the ill fortune to cross swords with this type of person quickly discovered their curious Bushido. The warriors of atheism would deploy strange, sophistic arguments, saying, for example, that there were no atheist beliefs. As for that matter, a thing called new atheism. An atheist was just someone who didn't believe in God, despite all being identi identical stormtrooper-like clones. <laughs> now, that's Pritchett-style language yes, there. Yes, that's, that's, that's great. That's having the last word was a way of life, a matter of honor. And that's true. It does seem like a matter of honor on both sides, honestly, of those of us who are interested in objective truth, who, who want to make that the priority. Whether you're an atheist or a Christian, if you feel that way, it, there are a lot of people in that camp who it does seem like an issue of honor that they're able to cite that reference or have the last word or go yeah. 30 rounds deep in a thread nobody's reading. Right, right? like you so often do like i've i've done that once in like three years and you had to call me out on it <laughs> and i was like what are you why are you talking to these people the, the, these eccentrics and by the way if you ask questions just put question i'll, I'll get to them these eccentric souls venerate venerated the big beasts of new atheism hitchens was their john the baptist dawkins their messiah Dennett, a font of solomonic wisdom and of course sam harris has a militant crusading richard the lion heart putting the terroristic saracenes into the sword there was a time when this perspective had serious appeal on the left. In the era of the climate skeptic presidency, George Bush and hysterical fa fears that the U.S. religious right were about to usher in a handmaiden's tale style theocracy. New atheism was seen as a potent antidote. So they're talking about how, yeah, so it seemed like it, there was, it made sense for it to take off. Yeah. This movement reached its height in Britain in 2010 after the clerical abuse scandal had sharpened anti-religious rhetoric. And of course, we've seen that happen here, too. Popular science programs. Okay, so now it got to be common, they're saying, on children's programs and elsewhere. In a family-friendly way, you can knock religion. This was also, the, or not knock religion, that's not fair, but provide uh, explanations and narratives on television that, that were not hospitable to, right. without concern at all for religious or, or caveat. Or even take shots at it. But there were always tensions. Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens in particular were both strongly associated with hostility towards Islam, a feature of right-wing politics. Dawkins was more of an equal opportunity offender, but his rhetoric against Islam was scarcely less ferocious. And we're going to come back to those names, or at least one of them, in a few minutes. But much of the, that new, I'm skipping things here, much of what new atheism embodied has now migrated rightwards. The young rationalist males, uh, male of today is watching Jordan Peterson videos and listening to the Joe Rogan podcast. Dawkins himself is now an anti-woke figure. The people that are most furiously applying evolutionary psychology to human relations today. Now, this is where he really does give some Pritchettarian type language, but probably beyond what you would say. So we'll just. Are you avoiding saying that the new atheists are now incels? <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. No, I'm, gonna, I'm putting that out there. Well, you can read that portion, but I'm just saying this is someone's opinion. Yeah, I don't know. Dawkins that, himself is now in quote anti-woke figure. 
the people that are most furiously applying evolutionary psychology to human relations today's today are incels with concepts like hypergamy, assortive mating, alpha and beta males popularized online by lonely young men looking for explanations as to why they can't get a date. This guy is a great writer. Sorry, New Atheist. I didn't want him to skip that. <laughs> as a movement, New Atheism has funny. fractured and lost its original spirit. Its afterlife on the right sees it allied with pseudo-mystical Jungianism, veneration of the nationalist mythos, outright neo-paganism, and strategic alliances with religious conservatives. Yeah, you could take like the Tom Askell, James Lindsay type alliance, you know, on mm -hmm. certain things. You can see Michael Shermer again lamenting about um, the current state of science being more narrative driven than fact based. And yeah, that's that's all happening. And, 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 and agreeing, you know, he would agree in principle with with like Michael Jones, who's interested in those kinds of things. You know. Yeah. Another portion has moved leftwards embodied by the I, I effing love science yeah. woke nerd of uh, that's the woke nerd of today. That's the woke nerd of today where once nerd culture was marginal. It is now the dominant commercial force and it is force forcefully allied, not with rationalism, but with progressivism. This is interesting because you would want, you would expect like the classic nerd is the one who cares all about the objective facts. Yeah. Right. And it's true that the nerd has become a cult part of culture. Everybody knows that I, it's probably been 10 years ago, but there was a great skit that SNL or somebody did where it was this bar scene and there was this really like she was supposed to be your stereotypical hot girl, but she had glasses on. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so she was like, she said something about, Star Wars or something. And she's like, I guess I'm just such a nerd. And it went to this guy who was like really overweight and acne issues. Not that we're at all denigrating those the people that suffer with those things, but he's, he's standing there and he's like, hi, I'm an actual nerd. <laughs> it's, like, it's not, it's, it's like, what you, but, but so, but that's happened. That yeah. is what has happened. And uh, that's an important piece of this that we need to remember where once nerd culture was marginal and is now dominant. Okay. We read that. The nerd of yesteryear rallied against the hysterical right. Railed. Uh, yeah, railed Railed. against the hysterical right, blaming this is what the hysterical right. This I don't think this line was written well, but it's this is what the hysterical right was doing. D and D for, blaming D and D for sa satanic ritual murder. Yes, really, and accusing violent video games of inspiring school shootings. Now, however, the Rick and Morty watching, comic book convention attending, board game playing geek is an enthusiastic supporter of LGBTQ plus rights. And bearded, pot-bellied podcasters take breaks from reviewing the latest superhero franchise to pontificate about police violence and women's representations. His heroes are not Dawkins, though there's lingering affection and shared canon there. Not really. But Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's not religious, but he's a gentler sort of atheist. One who can spare a tear for the plight of Palestine, uh, Palestine and cheerfully celebrate his friend's tasteful same-sex ceremony in a suitably enlightened evangelical church. Science, this sort of character can assure you, is firmly on the side of every progressive cause and opinion. So he, he says all of this to show you that the idea of being the nerd atheist has been co-opted. Yeah. From the people who are interested in objective truth, which undergirds science to and now, therefore to science, the, to the narrative of that modernist sort, type, to this new thing yeah. that's not the same. Yes, and we know that there are Christians who've done the same thing. Now, even though this article isn't talking about that, there are Christians yes. who have done that and given up putting uh, objective truth. Yes, as and once again, to everyone who paid attention uh, to the Southern Baptist Convention, the the factions of uh, you know, they they accuse each other of following along these same lines, right? I mean, um, the, the the conservative Baptist network, Founders Ministries types, they, they are considered to be the fundamentalist old school uh, types. And then the, uh, the they, they, they deny calling themselves liberal or progressive or whatever. But the other side accuses them of being that. And I do believe that there is truth to both of what they're accusing the other side of being. So, you know, it was it was interesting um, the way one guy asked a question about various hermeneutics being taught at um, Gateway Seminary. And when he read the literature of Gateway Seminary, he read it correctly to where it sounded like advocating for and affirming it. And then the president sits there and tell... Uh, uh, org or whatever his name is sits there and tells them that no that's not what you just heard read is not the case <laughs> and i'm sitting here thinking how long are so, the, so you can see that you know they're having do these assignments as if you're 
you're you're taking these. I mean, so guys, I mean, queer readings of Jonathan and Solomon and and you oh, know boy. all those passages are on their way as assignments for for Southern Baptist Seminary students, at least in California. So I, I mean, I, there is truth to that in the SBC and broader, where you have the deconstructionist progressive Christianity, and they're all affirming cultural narratives, versus you know. Uh, the more traditional Christians, whether they're Protestant, Catholic, or whatever, who still affirm objective truth, and that being the primary driver for their epistemology and how they analyze the world. Yeah, and so uh, I don't know where it went, but uh, honestly, Atheist said a minute ago, um, who is this audience? Who is the audience for this? And also said somewhere, I can't find it now, but that they were interested in wanting to know like where they fit. They're having trouble finding out where they fit. Well, we're going to come to that. We're going to make it a little bit easier. But who is the audience? I think honestly, and this is going to sound gross for Pritchett to say because he doesn't like to say things like this. But I think this is important to having better conversations. Yeah, I also think it's important for Christians or otherwise I wouldn't have Said brought it, it up in the. Uh, what I consider to be All the right. best presentation at the. <laughs> <laughs> well, Eric Hernandez spoke there, but not on not as a keynote. Okay, All I mean, right. if you, if you take my presentation, yours, and, and Michael Jones, yeah, it, that's it's no. Good. That's half of Eric's quality. All right, oh, that, that's true too. Yeah, but I'm talking about between the three of us. Let's do new atheism. I, so we're almost done with this article here. New atheism is dead, but the materialism that underwrote it lives on more powerfully and subtly than ever. And Gregory Fisher wanted to say that that is a particularly helpful observation. The curious sort of pugnacious integrity has gone, replaced with a far more pragmatic and amorphous spirit appropriate to the age of liquid modernity. The new atheists were perversely very concerned with questions of metaphysics and epistemology, whereas a newer generation of materialists of both left and right are concerned only with power, not capital T truth. In many respects, the neoconservative and new atheist movement of the 2000s was, however, perversely the last gasp of idealistic, traditionally religious politics that prioritized truth over, over power. power. Yes. That's, and the, imagine, that's the difference. That's and, the postmodernism. And, yeah. yeah. The modern left and right do not care about truth. Whether you label it truth. revolutionary fervor or fascist ruthlessness, they are united in their steady movement towards totalitarian habits of language and mind. Yes. Science, like religion, culture, ethnicity, history, is treated as something to be mined for elements that advance the ideological narrative and pave the road to political power, which is sought for the purpose of destroying the rival ideology. These ideologies are materialist and naturalist, but uh, not by dint of lofty intellectual commitments, but rather implicitly because no idea is allowed to be larger than the cause. Justice, truth, beauty, and compassion are second order principles to be credited to whatever project you support and denied to opponents and rivals. The narratives. Uh, yeah. Okay. What did I say again? Well, no, I'm saying yeah. what, what I'm, I'm, his language is what we're calling cultural narr narrative. Yes. Yeah, so now, oh, well, this is the last paragraph of the yeah. article. The religion of science has degenerated into the cult of technology. The search for truth has become the pursuit of profit and productivity. The materialism of imminent wonder in the face of the natural world has become an indifference to everything but pleasure and consumption. The liberation of the human mind promised by atheism has fast descended into the liberation of individual license and selfishness. The high idealism of liberal humanism and experimental science has proved unsustainable once shorn of the last remnants of the, of the enchanted religious cosmos that it sought to banish. Yep. Now, this is a great and and and. And I want you to elaborate on what I'm about to say to help set this up, because I, I think because we're about to show the chart. Well, yeah, but but in, in an example of this in the real world of what we're trying to illustrate uh, is, you know, you like to use illustrations, right, for mm -hmm. sermons. Well, let's use a recent uh, cultural phenomenon that happened on Twitter when Richard Dawkins basically uh, affirmed normal biology. And well, that's one of the things I was going to bring up. Yes. So let's so talk use about that as that. an example to yeah. illustrate this phenomenon. That is that is a good. So yeah. So you see this happen. Well, OK, so Richard Dawkins, you brought that up. He had he put this thing about I think it was about the trans um, or he was just talking. Was he talking about the trans athlete stuff or was he just talking about trans? Stuff? He's just talking about but he but he suggested he suggested the traditional um, collapsing of of genders into the sexes as it related yeah as it related to making scientific like biology, biology yeah. And stuff. yeah okay well whatever he said because i'm probably not saying that to someone's satisfaction but whatever he said he said at the end thoughts but he kind of asked a question that is an often asked question 
by or seemed to uh, hint towards something that conservatives often yeah, say and, about this. And all heaven broke loose over yes. between these atheists tearing each other yes. apart. Now you and this you might be revoking thinking, previous awards that he had won and all kinds yeah, of stuff from the humanist national humanist. Yeah, but the, but the but the thing was everybody you might be thinking well you're you putting internet like YouTube atheists which one do you put them in surely you put them into the well that's the thing they're they're fractured mm-hmm. and guess what Christian YouTubers are fractured yep. over this issue of where we're placing the importance of truth. And that has put us in a rough spot. I mean, that you see this uh, more broadly, even with famous atheists like Ricky Gervais has a new comedy special in which he he kind of does a commentary of sorts about the trans issue. You see, uh, well, Bob, uh, Bob Price uh, made some statements. I don't know what all statements he has, so I don't even know where he agrees with me to what extent or whatever on these issues like about CRT and all these kind of things. But it's another example of where atheists were fractured because of these cultural things. And, and that sounds too much like it goes our against favorite our favorite atheist Pine Creek thinks that all of that. CRT Pine Creek that is stuff. another example. Uh, uh, he, and, well, and he, and people are fractured by it. Daggummit, we were back, but without sound. Okay, we're back now, and we've got sound. So let me set that up again. Okay, well, we talked about Pine Creek. Yeah. How he seems to be more in the objective truth, whereas there are other YouTube atheists, I think, given by their own statements, Mm -hmm. seem to be more interested. And I wasn't talking about You mentioned Shannon Q. Yeah, I did mention Shannon Q. I don't think so. I think you think that because you know she holds different than you on some of these Social issues where that does Creek. come, where that does come. I'm talking about, play. I'm talking about atheists versus atheists. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm saying I don't, I put her in the same category as Pine Creek of being concerned with objective truth. Oh, do you? I just think she came to different conclusions. So that my point here, well, let's go to the chart. Let's yeah. go to the chart. All right. Um, so here it is. Now, I came up with, I was thinking through this idea, and as I was talking to Pritchett, we kind of formed out this chart in our heads just in conversation, so I just made one. Now, the colors uh, and letters represent things that are shared, um, and uh, and then the, so, so here's what you have. Now, these titles are not textbook titles. They're not titles you'll find in the literature or anything like that. We're just calling them this for to, to keep our minds straight. Yeah. So truth, truth, atheist and truth, Christian, you see down there at the bottom, those are, those are atheists and Christians who privilege objective truth. Right. And, uh, they just want to go wherever the science goes or wherever the facts go. Yeah. And uh, they yeah. don't care. Theoretically, they may not like where it goes, but they're willing to accept it. Right. And that's their they're, driving they're a, force. They're epistemo- epistemology, all of what, what we typically called correspondence belief, you know, or something like that. Correspondence theory of truth. These people pretty much share the same epistemological outlook on how objective truth works. Yeah. How truth works, period. That it is objective. Whereas the other categories, the narrative categories, the narrative atheist and the narrative Christian, they would prioritize outcomes of narratives the, the 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 cultural the cultural things that they want to promote their their causes which is goes ties back into making claims of power and, and privilege of of narrative ideas at the, primary we're moving fast here so i yeah, need you to tell primary me primary <laughs> and all the other things are secondary to that yeah yeah 
to that which they privilege. Okay, so first of all, Jim Amberg, thank you so much. And he says, thanks for slowing down the show so I can catch up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah appreciate that. Sorry, we had a hiccup for people that may see this later when we edit that out. Um, yeah, so let's be clear again. Honestly, atheists says atheists are not a monolith, especially in our highly polarized political climate. The atheist community, quote unquote, is fractured around similar issues as the general population is because we're just people. Right. And okay, it- hold on, hold on. So so let's put the chart back up because I... I I should have said this already, but this is something I mentioned to Jonathan is people are going to think you're saying, oh, this means like the real atheism or the way all atheists that are really atheists think. And the same for Christians. That's not what we're saying. No. There can be atheists who who have a range of views that overlap much of the views with the narrative atheist on the top. Yeah. But they hold them for different reasons. All we're talking about here is do you prioritize objective truth? in getting to conclusions. Yeah. Over and, over and, and the, the narrative, narrative explanation is again simple one sentence explanation of the narrative. The narrative are the people who prioritize their cultural desired outcomes mm-hmm. over truth. Yeah. Yeah. So what that leaves us with is postmodernists versus modernists. Yeah. So so um so here's what that does for us. So you've got this nice little chart here. Yes. And notice what we 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 can see with this. So you the the atheists and the Christians on on the bottom of this chart with the T with the truth, the truth atheists and the truth Christians. They are going to be on the same team in one sense. Now all of the Christians that are like always looking for us to say things that they think sound liberal or compromisey or things like that. They're all going to freak out, but I don't care. The, the fact is we're on the same team in regards to this one issue of a, the importance of objective truth. Yes. Right. And the Christian, the, the Christian, uh, in the gold there, uh, the narrative Christian or the truth Christian, they're going to disagree on all kinds of stuff. Yes. There are some people in the progressive church movement that I would consider these narrative Christians. And yes. those people um, are going to disagree with me on important things. And impor- also, we should note, I'm using the term Christian because we're talking about categories of people who identify as Christian or atheist. So I'm not even saying that doctrinally I would consider them an Orthodox Christian yeah, or something. Yeah, we're that's not the point. We're not talking about. We're just are they talking really, truly about born categories. Again, blah blah blah. Right, we're not doing that. Yeah, that's so yeah, the Christian, that's narrative Christian, and the truth Christian, they're going to agree on uh, on you know we would presume some things. Yeah. Right. Okay. So they can work together on one front, although we're going to also be responding to them. Yeah. And the truth and the truth atheist and the truth Christian, they're going to respond to each other on one for on, on a lot of fronts, but they're going to be agreed in responding to the objective truth issue. That's the problem with the narrative atheist and the narrative Christian. Right. And so, they're going so, to be responding to the narrative atheist. Yeah. So here's what happens. So, this means so, yeah. you don't just have, it's the job is not just I'm responding to you and you're responding to me. It's yeah. I'm responding to three different categories. Right. You, your doppelganger that's that's has some things in common with you but doesn't value truth like you do, and then the Christian that doesn't value truth like yeah, I do. Yeah, because you could have a narrative you atheist. Have three. You could have a narrative atheist, a narrative Christian, and a truth atheist. All agree that abortion is good. <laughs> They're yay for abortion. Those three. The truth Christian overwhelmingly don't think that. But the narrative atheist and the narrative Christian are going to affirm abortion for different reasons than the truth atheist would likely affirm abortion. And the narrative of, Christian might. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, I'm saying the, 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 the narrative atheist and the narrative Christian are going to probably affirm abortion for the same reasons, while the truth atheist, who also agrees with them on abortion, are probably doing so on different epistemological grounds. Right, right, right. Than, yeah. Now, and here's the problem. Here's what confuses all of this worse is everyone on this screen, everyone on that list says that they value science. Now they don't all, they don't all always say they, the objective truth. I mean, if, I mean, we've seen people say that's offensive in our culture to talk about objective yeah. truth, right? So, so they won't all do that, but they will pretty well all say, uh, they'll want to say science is on their side. Yep. So that confuses it because that, oh, you, then you're affirming objective truth, which undergirds science, but not necessarily. It's just that 
remember what the guy said in the article. This was birthed out of a different movement almost that only has similar, only kisses a little bit. And yeah. so as a result of that, um, they're using all of a lot of the accoutrement of the previous movement, like science, 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 but they don't have the um, epistemological. Yeah, I mean, and that's for, that. the, for, for the narrative atheist and the narrative Christian is going to be science, science, science when it suits them. And then, in, uh, you know, in a different conversation, science is white supremacy. <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's what you have to. And, and that's not a contradiction for them. Right. It's mm -hmm. oh, it, it, they don't worry about those kinds of things. You know, mm -hmm. I think it ultimately leads to cognitive dissonance when you uh, hold those kinds of opposing views. But that's postmodernism. They're fine with that kind of thing. It's fine for science to be racist. But when it suits your purpose, it's you need to uh, trust the science. And the next thing is, whereas the, the, the truth atheist is not like the narrative on why we should follow science. Because the. Truth atheists like Michael Shermer will lament science when the scientific community buys more into promoting narratives rather than uh, looking at objective facts from scientific And, and now notice something. Um, yeah, okay. So Brando says, shouldn't Christians be narrative Christians built on truth? And of course, we're not saying that nar the narrative is not important how would you respond to that Pritchett? don't get hung up on the word narrative if you're thinking of like narratives as in story the word narrative has appeared more in our uh conversations about worldview and politics in the last five years more than the previous 25 years before that i mean narrative so so narrative what we mean by narrative atheist and narrative christian is not like follow the trajectory of a story outline. What we're talking about narrative is those who promote certain narratives in the culture that they want to see become dominant will promote those narratives at the expense of objective truth and yeah, facts yeah. because those are inconvenient to the narrative. So we're using the word narrative in kind of in, in that postmodernist sense. Yeah, yeah. To uh, contrast it from the objective So so sense. really yeah. I think that I feel like we're in a room that has a lot of controversial furniture in it, but we're not really moving any of it. I right. mean, I don't know why this would be really controversial to most people who are at any point on this graph. Because the reality is No, I, I, it is controversial because narrative atheists and narrative Christians do not like worldview exposés on what they're really doing. Oh yeah. Okay. So that's yeah. because they want to be able to say, like you said, science is awesome when it supports their narrative, but they also want to be able to say science is racist when it presents data that is factual, that contradicts the narrative. Uh -huh. And so they don't want to be called out for what they are doing. That's why, um, Whoa. I don't, yeah, that's why so many of them do not like people who pull the wool back, whether it's a Christian or an atheist like James Lindsay on the, some, you know, the, the postmodernist uh, and, and, and what sometimes gets dubbed as cultural Marxism and all that stuff. But it's also not a, fin well, Faithiest Atheist says in this case, they're using the word narrative as an idea that could be objectively false, but a person will feverishly defend it anyway. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Now, um, what was the last thing? Like men get said? pregnant is a narrative. Oh, another thing. No, here's another thing. <laughs> that's not, that's so, not so here's another true. thing. So when we're talking about, um, cause you might be thinking this is controversial cause you might be thinking what we're saying. And I've said this already. I want to say it again. You might be thinking we're saying, oh, so you're saying if people disagree with you on the trans issue, then they're in the, I don't care about truth camp. No, I'm not saying that explicitly. I think one, if one holds to that, to whatever view about trans that I don't hold and they hold there and they, and they get there and in their mind, they are consistently getting there with, while prioritizing objective truth, then, okay, well, you're technically still in the truth category, but I really want to see your work on paper. Yeah. You know, basically <laughs> that's, that's what, so you holding any particular view doesn't mean that you're in that other camp. It, at least among the yes, atheists, yes, one level up. It's it, it's, ju it's just doing it's just doing the uh, it's just doing the work of yeah. explaining. You can't. Yeah, that's what you were trying to correct me on, even though I didn't think you needed to. That any particular issue does not 
put someone in one of these particular categories. It's mm -hmm. one step up from the issues. Because that's why I used abortion as an example. Three different types of people on our chart could all agree on abortion, but two out of the three are going to agree for different reasons than the, the truth atheist. Because but this confusion yeah. has, has led to, well, what, like when you see it, when you see yeah. the fracturing happen, it off, and it happens among Christians. Everybody fractures. Honestly, atheists said that, yeah, if you've got people, they're going to fracture, right? Yeah. And we think yeah, we have Christians a great explanation fracture. That's for why. why we put two but, categories of Christians. But yeah, but that's, but that's yeah, you got Christians that do the yeah, same it's thing. It's worldview and epistemology is what we're discussing here. I tried to set all but that up. That, but that's important what you're saying, yeah. because if it is the case that you're talking to someone that whether they admit it or not, you just become convinced they are, the, the, I mean, on with good reason to become. They don't just say this to get out of an argument. They, they don't care. That they, they don't value objective truth. If you get to the place where where it sounds like the narrative is more important than the truth, yeah, then what's the what is the point of that conversation? I agree. It's yeah. if you prioritize objective truth, you're going to be just completely flabbergasted and frustrated. That's why I was telling people in Texas that it doesn't matter what you say to people. They don't care. They absolutely don't care which, you know, to, to help some of you out, narrative Christian, narrative atheists are the types of people who would say stuff like that's your truth. Yeah. They're that. And whether they admit it or not that they oppose objective truth, the point of this arg article from the critic is to say that's what you are. And we, and, and, and we know that, some of you in the know know how to skirt around the, uh, the, the, the criticism of being in that group because you, you're in the know, but you know that you believe it anyway, and you just don't like us calling you on it. Right, but, right. Hey, House of Comments, so glad you found us. They say, yippee, another Christian channel subbed in a heart. Yeah. We're thrilled that you're here. Um, yeah, so questions. Anybody that has any questions for us about anything or comments yeah. or want to tell us we're wrong? Whatever you want to do. Uh, Jim Amberg has just caught up. Now everyone is talking really slow. Yep. As we always say, when you go back to off of uh, double speed, it, everyone sounds drunk. Right. Yeah. So um, and unless we get some questions here in a little bit, we'll, we'll probably just wrap it up. Now, here's a couple of, pro of, of apologies that I have to make. Jonathan, I'm one of those people that's a big picture type guy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do do detail stuff, but I have to really try. I have to really focus. I know. I, you give me the big picture and I have to do the details. You have that's to do the details. That, that's Trinity. how we do it. Yeah. I have to do all the grunt work. I mean, that's how it works. But the, I like, like the details. But like I will, I'm the guy that likes to run in a video game or something. Andy, uh, one of our other, the guy who's going to do the other podcast with me, uh, limited podcast, supernatural stories, unless we change the title. Um, but, but, you know, if we're playing a video game, he'll spend forever being tactical and never engage yeah. in the fight because he's trying to be, you know, sleuth and everything. Or sleuth, yeah. is that the right word? Sneaky, whatever, stealth. And me, I'm more running to the middle of everything and start shooting and see what happens. Right. Now, here's the great thing. That's where you get to the moments of greatest, like the most incredible things happen. And you 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 knocked out 20 players in, like you were you were John Wick or something. Andy's not going to get many experiences like that. He's being too tactical. He's hanging back, but he lives a lot more than I do. Right. right? And I'm kind of, I'm kind of um, uh, like that, but I'm, I'm more of the run in there. And as a result, I often say things like, Hey, I'm going to do a verse by verse of the entire book of Genesis. And then four years later I get it done, but it's because I ran in and shooted before I thought maybe I shouldn't do this because maybe <laughs> I won't keep up with it. Like I should. Right. But I'm glad that I have that aspect. And like you said, we can balance each other out in ways. One of the things I promised was that there would be an episode from the Jude series this week, and there wasn't, and it's probably going to be the last episode. It's going to hopefully be next week. But I continually overpromise. Now, here's the other thing, is Letters from Ignorantia, my audio, my book, and now as an audio book, it is absolutely free for people who financially support us, which means it's not really free but I'll put it this way. I don't know what it costs. It costs at least 10 or 15 bucks. I think the audio book or maybe more than that, or it'll use one of your credits on audible, but you can become a patron for a dollar a month and you can have it. Cause I've just given it to patrons. It's yeah, free and for everyone the, with the cover art. The, Bam. How about that? Internet. Yeah, and we have the Calvinist series going. Calvinist yeah, series. Episode fun. three launch. You just dropped the third episode. Good things happening. Be up next Good week. things happening. Um, yeah, I bring up uh, the super chat from Faithiest Atheist because I, I have some comments about about what he's saying here in his super chat. Yeah, Faithiest Atheist says, 
But now, whenever a theist or atheist encounters someone who disagrees with them, they'll accuse them of being a narrative oriented. You're just a narrative atheist. You're just a narrative Christian. They'll accuse them of being narrative oriented. So maybe, sadly, in the end, we've only agreed on better language. No, we well, we are on the objective truth side of things, so Thank we can sort things chat. out. And we all agree that this is this is what's happening. That's why the that's why I said it in Texas long before the critic must have watched my episode and said, yeah, you know what? That really is. And a then thing. I randomly saw it and yeah. thought, that's a great idea. <laughs> right. That's really a thing. It is really a thing. OK, uh, faith is atheist. It really is a thing. And here's how you know who you're talking to. Mm -hmm. OK. A narrative Christian and a narrative atheist are not likely to admit that's what they are when they are talking to you. Mm -hmm. When they are talking to themselves and amongst themselves, you see it all over the gibberish, what I consider to be gibberish, spewing forth from their mouths. I'm talking about the, the Christians and atheists on the narrative side of things. That's is, what I'm is, talking about. Is, is they, this... they may not admit it to you, but if you go see what they're saying to each other and themselves and in, in their own little corners, you know that that's what they are. Is, so. um, is the... Um... Critic, your but new some favorite of them magazine. May, Is the critic your new favorite magazine? No, but some of them. But that's not all of them. So I, I want to be fair to some of the narrative camp because some of them will admit it. Yes, they will be like, yeah, yeah. I mean, objective. What is there is no and, and and honestly, atheist asked again a minute ago. Like, well, I mean, how but what if I, what if what if my narratives are informed by what I believe are objective truth? Well, okay, that's fine. I mean, we we all have narratives. That that's that's like it's like I wrote the book letters from Ingrantia that's now again free for patrons. Um, for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash Trinity radio. But I mean, who wants to talk about that? Um, but, uh, that is a book that warns about a lot of the dangers of systematic theology, but guess what? Everyone has a systematic theology. Yeah. Now this is where I want to say, you know how I always Everyone say, has a story, a narrative. say Nietzsche is the, the, um, he, he is the eschatological atheist, yeah. right? You know, the 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 he's their, he's their theologian for eschatology. I want to, I want to say that Alex Rosenberg is a prophet. Right. Because uh -huh. long before we were having these conversations, he wrote a book that he said about the end of the book. None of this means anything, obviously, if I'm right. <laughs> right. And, and so Alex Rosenberg is that one example of a uh, this is why I'm calling a prophet. He's a contradiction because he probably want he, he because he he wants you to believe what he's saying. Right. But he mm -hmm. knows that what he's saying doesn't matter and it is, is not it has no ultimate. It has no meaning. It's just gibberish. And he he shows, I think, in his work, the outcome that I think, and this is going to probably bother um, uh, the faith of atheists if, and the objective truth, Michael Shermer types. But I think if atheism is true, you're all in the narrative camp. Because even your claim to objective truth is just another narrative. If Ooh, Alex oh. Rosenberg is right that God doesn't exist and all our words are just blather. Okay. Well, right? I have to think about that. If but, Alex, if, 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 but they still have truth, the narrative, right? I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to do with this, like with uh, uh, rationality. Yeah, yeah. And uh, all epistemologically, kind of they have the same objective tr that we have. But if atheism is true, that simply collapses because it's an illusion if God doesn't exist and Rosenberg is right. And so even claiming that you affirm that epistemology is still just another narrative. And it would be for Christians too, right? Uh, but I'm just saying if he's right, if Alex Rosenberg is right, that's why I'm giving him the, 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 the atheist prophet label. Because if he's right, then even if you want to affirm, and, the, and, and sorry, this is going to bother some of the Christians now. This is why presuppositionalism is often helpful <laughs> to, to point that kind of thing. Out. Jim Amberg. Thank you for that. Super chat channel. Angel says this is from Brando. And he wanted me to ask you if there are certain video games or types you won't play or think are wrong for Christians to play. I think anytime someone puts this is for Brando, we should say for Brando. For Brando. Okay. Yes. You do and, it with us. And by us. the way, you Across can go Internet buy our new land. merchandise using the discount code Brando, Brando. and get 20% off. Until June 30th on select products. Yeah. No, Boy, man, we got to do that through Father's Day. It's through June 30th. When, what's today's date? The 17th. When's Father's Day? Like this Sunday. Oh, man. I think. 
Am I Are wrong? you getting good stuff for Father? I don't. I'm. I don't. Probably not. I got a new dishwasher, and I said, "Don't buy me anything else." That thing was expensive. I think I have to put my dryer on top of my washer for Father's Day. Okay. Th- no. Then, then what I'm thinking is, how about we extend it through Independence? I don't Day. know how the I did it. Like, we're we're we're. No, I don't understand Teespring, and I don't know how I did it, and I can't change it. Oh. For Brando. Well, then right, re-up let's, it let's for on. four more days for the through Independence okay. Day. Okay. Through the 4th of July. Okay. You want for it to be patriotic. Um, June 30th is my wedding anniversary. I launched Trinity Radio Extra on a topic related to the 4th of July. Well, let's so. talk about the per- topic this guy paid. Yes, don't about. play video games where you beat women for points. Like Grand oh, Theft I, Auto. Okay, I agree with that. Yeah. I agree with that. If the now, video game says thing. you can get a higher score if you beat women now, and treat them Jonathan, like garbage. you don't know enough about video games to answer this question. Let me answer this I question. know that you can beat women for points in Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, you, you did correctly identify one thing in video games that's bad. <laughs> go ahead. go Do more. Give us your commentary. What I was going to say is, number one, anything in the video game that you would already be objectionable to in film or television, well, automatically you should be object. Like, for example, Grand Theft Auto has a story and cutscenes and uh, stuff like that. And some of these video games have nudity and sexual content and that sort of thing. So anything that would bother you in a TV show or a movie, um, you should be concerned about there. Now, with video games, I think what most people think of, and, and what I just said is more and more an issue, I think what what most people are thinking of is the violence aspect to it. Like, is, yeah. is it ever? And, um, you know, I think that's a question of personal conviction. One thing I do think to keep in mind is if you're watching nudity on a screen or something and you're a person and you're, you know, it causes you to lust, there really is nudity on There really is a naked woman or a naked right. man on the screen. That's real. But when someone gets shot and they die in combat in a movie or a video game, nobody really got shot. Right. That's not real. When someone cusses, that's real. When someone takes the Lord's name in vain, that's real. So I think that's an important thing. Now, if it's just violent, just for gory's sake, that's probably not good. That's probably not a good thing. Or if like, yeah, the point of the game is to shoot up a school or something. I doubt that game will get through. Yeah, that that, that would be bad. But I don't think tactical games that are military games or things like that. I think that uh, that's just part of human nature is to be men are going to be interested in that yeah. sort of thing. There's a Christian actor named Neil McConaugh, McDonough, I, I guess. Anyway, um, he, he talked about this. He's a, he's a Christian and he's married and he will not kiss an actress as part of his contract. Oh yeah. The guy with the white hair. Yeah. He's had white hair forever. Since he was you, born. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Born with white hair. Um, and he will not kiss any just actresses. his wife just his wife and he said well how come you'll shoot people you know he plays a lot of villains yeah you know and he's like yeah but that's fake it's unless you're alec baldwin that's fake and <laughs> right then, and then, exactly and then uh, i shouldn't laugh at that because that woman really did die i think yeah. um but but no seriously that's fake and the kiss is real right now and that's nudity is real to keep in mind. well I mean, nudity is real. Sometimes they enhance it. Or well, whatever. okay, but they want you to believe it's real, and it right. is real. It's real right. enough. Right. She's yeah. obviously naked in the scene. So yeah, 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 yeah. But but he was like, yeah, violence. That's that's fake. But there's a. I want to say there's a different kind of violence where you're in a video game, and you're just shooting bad guys who are coming at you with guns or whatever. Uh-huh. And the violence of, I'm going to do better at this game if I beat a woman. Right. For points. Think about this. Again, what these are the myths that we tell ourselves as a culture. And, and yeah. what I think, even though there are good um, uh, anti-hero type stories, I, I think ultimately what we want to tell kids and, and young people and even in our adventure things and games like that that are adventure oriented is uh, those guys are the bad guys. Uh, I'm the good guy. You know, not that you can't have an anti story story, especially for games aimed at adults. But I just think young people need to understand if I'm in, if I'm in a game, no, let's not say Grand Theft Auto, but a game with the same mechanics, where say I'm a soldier, okay, mm-hmm. I, I don't, if it's, if I'm able to go kill a woman in the game, that's something you're able to do. But the point of the game should not be to go kill women. The point of the game should be to kill the bad guys. Right? Well, sometimes <laughs> bad guys are beautiful women, women. With, with guns shooting at you. Well, that's yes, but that's 
quit. You tell me not to caveat things, and then when I don't, yeah. you, you're, yeah, but you <laughs> didn't enough. caveat that. Brando has, I think they get the point where we're saying, Brando has a question that's actually on our topic today. Brando says, should Christians always be truth Christians, or are there circumstances to take a narrative Christian route or to take influence from it? Uh, yes, they should always be truth Christian. Remember how we're using the term narrative. You yes, can, narrative just means not not um, privileging truth as the highest goal. Right. Seeing the narrative have a positive outcome in your favor ideal, ideologically is precedent over truth of what we mean by narrative. So, uh, yes, Christians should always prioritize objective truth. Jesus says, I am the truth, right? So, yes. Um, now, this is interesting. I, uh, people, you know, come back to that. I have friends, okay that are in like uh, urban apologetics, woke church and all that kind of stuff, which is a different kind of woke than the secular woke scene. For some of them, not all of them. Now this is, now take CRT for example. CRT in my mind is Euro trash epistemological garbage with all of its underwriting being absolutely incompatible. Uh, post-structuralism, post-modernism, uh, you know, feminist uh, theory, all of this Marxism, all that crap. Okay, it's garbage, and I have no problem telling uh, everyone that I think that, including um, some, not not most, but there are some in the in the uh, urban apologetics that think it's a good idea, and I think they're just mistaken. Um, but just because CRT is trash doesn't mean that. It's epistemological garbage. Doesn't mean that someone who advocates for CRT might have come to a true conclusion. That's not not giving any credit to any just because they're made in the image of God and 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 they stumbled across something that's objectively true that I can agree with. Doesn't mean that I like how they reach that conclusion. It doesn't mean that I approve of their methodology, but it does mean that that you're right about that thing. Okay? Same thing with, 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 you know, with other opposing worldviews, okay? Same thing, same thing with uh, that I can agree with Michael Shermer on objective truth. You don't have what's true about reality, but at least you and I agree that that's the right way to look at reality, right? So I don't agree with his atheism, but we at least agree on objective truth. So Christians should always be people who affirm objective truth. That does not mean that we are going to always disagree with narrative Christians or narrative atheists on every single issue, which is what we were trying to, to explain earlier, because you may come to the same conclusion for different reasons. We used abortion as an example. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like to agree and say in Democrat ran cities, you see systemic racism everywhere where they continue to perpetuate it because they control the city councils and the, and the mayors and the police police precincts and the zoning and the housing laws and the property Jonathan. taxes. And yet, Jonathan. you know, and, and it's like systemic racism. Yeah. But a lot of that's the uh, Democrats doing that. Just like the Democrats started all that in history. Anyway. So I can agree with you. We come to different conclusions about systemic racism and how prevalent it is in the culture. But where I do agree, you, they sometimes don't like me saying it often occurs in Democrat ran cities. Uh, but, but anyway, we can agree on certain things. It doesn't mean that we agree on epistemology. So, we should always be truth. Now, using narrative in a different sense, it's good to tell stories, right? Yeah, in the in other senses, yes. In other senses, but, like okay. telling stories that, and, and that's using a long, narrative. I don't know how that could be more yeah. comprehensive than what right. you just got. Okay. All right. Um, uh, JP looks like he's about to beat you for points. Uh, let's <laughs> let's go to the faithiest atheist. What? Go. Thank you for that super chat again. Maybe deluding ourselves is a huge factor in how we survive. Well, Pritchett, did you want to say something about that? You looked like you were about to say something. I, but I, I, I was going to say. I think when people reject the truth of the gospel, that happens. That's um, how I'll answer that question. Okay. Um, I, yeah. Well, and I think it's interesting, like, when you think about, like, I, I don't know. I mean, I've just. Romans one agrees with that for everyone except for Faithiest Atheist is really um, well read and yes. has gone on some shows and stuff. So he's probably I know he's probably aware of this, but you know the I know y'all don't like churchy Christian answers to things, but I'm sorry. I, I, I think I think that 
that everyone besides Christians uh, do delude themselves. They exchange the truth for a lie and suppress the truth. Right? And he knows that I believe that. Yeah, I didn't so even I'm, hear what you said. Did you think I was trying to soft pedal something? I don't know. Um, what I was going to say uh, is Alvin planting his thing about um, how um, unlikely evolution is. The evolutionary argument. Well, you've got two things. One, how unlikely evolution is, but that has, actually isn't what I was going to go with. It's that we we've developed, we've evolved to to survive, but that's a different question than developing to locate truth. And, yeah, um, I mean, I mean, diluting ourselves doesn't have to do with biology as it do with psychology. So you could, but I'm saying like, it could be that we, that we have developed to dilute ourselves in certain respects because it takes the stress off or something. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But yeah. uh, honestly, atheist says how to identify an atheist according to Pritchett. You know it when you see it. Sounds like a narrative. Uh, no wrong. I mean, these, these are clear epistemological categories in science. I, I mean, in philosophy. So yeah, the reason why you can know it when you see it is not a narrative is because these things have definitions. So. Okay. Um, Jamie, right. And Pritchett, this is a good one for you. Mm -hmm. Um, God would tell your wife she looks fat in that dress. According false, to false, false, false. Because he's a God of truth. He's a God of fat. truth. Clothing does not make fat people look fat. Quit blaming. That's back to the garden. Blaming something. That's other. an equivocation. He means <laughs> you would tell her the truth about what she wants to know, right? Huh? Your wife comes out. And of course, this would never be true of your wife. But let's say that your wife was a different woman. And it is true of her that she looks fat in a dress. Then um, she says, do I look fat in this dress? Are you going to give her a dissertation about clothes don't make people look fat? Or how are you going to answer her? You know, my wife was the one who told me that joke that she had got from her uh, boss at work. But, okay, but what are you going to say? Are you Because basically what you just said is what the Christian metalhead just said you said, which is fat people make fat people look fat. <laughs> That's right. So look, I want to know, what are you going to say to your wife? What? What are you going to say to your wife? Well, I'm going to say no. My answer is, I'm gonna say, I'm a, I serve a God of truth, but the fact of the matter is you don't have to say everything that's true. You just don't <laughs> have to say it. That's what you'd say to your wife? You could be dodgy. You could you could do that. I'm not teaching people to be deceptively dodgy, but you could be like, well, you know, it's not my favorite dress that I've seen. I don't, I'm not wild about it. Of course, then the next question is, because it makes me look fat, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, back to square one. The answer is no, because I think <laughs> I, I think that, that, that a lie is a malicious attempt to deceive in my 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 saying no to a woman it doesn't have to why would it be my wife there's no reason why does it have to wife? be malicious to be a lie huh why does it have to because be because i malicious? think that's a good definition of a lie i don't what if my what if i'm with my wife what if a woman is with a man and she has fallen she she's thought about divorce and all these kind of things and she's really trying but she has lost a lot of the feeling he's betrayed her and after a few years, she's really trying and they're going to counseling and stuff. And she asks him or he asks her, do you love me as much as you used to? Well, if she lies there and says that she does, she didn't do that out of a malicious nature. She actually did it because she's and I'm not saying that's the right thing to do. I, I don't know that that's the right thing to do. I'm just saying it wasn't malicious. It was honest. It Wait, no, I'm saying a lie if she told... No, she doesn't really love him anymore like she did or doesn't feel the same. But, she's telling but he asked she her, does. do you? And yeah, she th says... That's, 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 that's making a statement that you know to be false intentionally. Right. That's malice. That's a Malice lie. is not... I'm trying to be... It's the same thing in defamation case. Anyway, uh, so what I'm saying is, number one, I, because I agree with Christian Metalhead that, that, that I have the technicality and I'm not intending to deceive maliciously. Yeah. I'm not speaking falsely if I just say no. Here's the thing. Uh, because it's not the dress. A man might lie about that, but that doesn't tell you anything about what's true or false. <laughs> it just tells you what he would do. Um, okay, so we've done those. Here's one from Actual Faith. Would you say there is a newer category of atheists today who are compromised or who comprised a former fundamentalist? Yes, who are deconverted. How can we do a better job of addressing their problems? Well, again, they're not monolithic either because what can be different there, aside from their beliefs, is the attitude with which they bring this. 
But I think you're thinking of like the atheist version of what we would call a cage stage Calvinist, you know, <laughs> someone who uh, someone who uh, is brand new or whatever or never went past some the first few things they learned. And they're going out there and using, uh, you know, the internet like a bully pulpit to yeah, I mean, yell and the, scream. The local chapter of every We Love Atheism club in every city is the son of a Baptist pastor who supposedly traumatized this atheist by dragging him to Sunday school when he was a kid. Um, which is not trauma, but whatever. Any caveats? Uh, I, I'm just saying, yeah, but that, that that that's that's the same category. It's always former fundamentalists who become atheists is a cat is a category of atheists that we've always have. Yeah, but those those atheists are going to splinter now. So because 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 atheism has moved on from the new atheist movement, exactly like the article we read. I don't. Think- those atheists are going to splinter into either truth atheists. Or they deconverted from Christianity because they became narrative Christians first and yeah. then became atheists because they realized that I, I, there's still I don't agree with the article about the degree to which internet atheism has uh, new atheism has shrunk on the internet. Um, I, I would like to, but uh, you know I, I think they're, they're just fractured. Um, and, yeah, know, there's just more of this other thing now. Right, yeah. right, and and I and you know to that end. It has shrunk in the sense that I think the article was trying to communicate that that was the voice of atheism, and now that's not the voice of atheism. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the, the, so, the relevance is different. Yeah. yeah. Um, but how can we do a better job? Well, if you, what you're trying to characterize is an attitude issue, if there's an attitude issue at play where it's like a real provocative, loud mouth, you know, debate me type person, you may not get very far there, but, it, but, but you should still... Um, I'm not going to tell you not to try to reach that person, but I will say this, and I have said it before, if you're talking to someone like that who can be very offensive and blasphemous and this and that, and, and that might trigger you, then then you might not be the best person to try to reach that person. Because the worst thing that happened is they say something that upsets you and you lose your cool and, and actually hurt the kingdom effort uh, in how you react. So uh, those are some thoughts I have about that. And Pritchett, I don't know what else is in the comments down here. I think we might have missed a super chat earlier. I think there was one sandwiched in between um, a couple of uh, faithiaths. Digital Gnosis wants to know what you think of his pull-ups. I I haven't seen the video yet. Why? Huh? Why? Because I do stuff. I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll ch- is it, if it's in the group, I'll, I'll see it eventually. Yeah. Um, but I was very impressed with his progress. I, I hope that he beats Pine Creek in their their uh, ch- six pack ab challenge. Hey, there. We have- oh, here it is. Monetary reminder that Calvinism is false. Thank <laughs> hey, man, you, thank you, the Christian metal. Thank head. you for the money. Our and brothers and sisters, the- they may be, but false we suspect it is. That's right. That's right. All right. Well, Pritchett, I don't really have anything keep, else keep for today. I, I do we think... find? Do we have more down here? Oh, you want me to keep going up? No. Okay. That was that one, and then we, we got that one. I, just making sure that we we, we got everything. Yeah. Okay. Because so got. it was the Christian metalheads, and boy, would our show have been incomplete without that note that that we will always find a way. Uh, to live up to our reputation of being anti-Calvinist by squeezing something in there. Uh, John Beaver says, hey, I can do three full pull-ups now when I couldn't do it either one, two months ago or 12 months ago. I remember when I got my first pull-up in years when I I had been at the gym for several months. And it, when you when you get that first one, and when I got that first one, I, w- I was just, that pull-ups became my favorite exercise because it was kind of the benchmark in my weight loss saga to where, oh, I can finally haul this bag of meat and get the chin over the bar. You know, it really is a, it is triumphant because most people in the world actually can't do a single pull-up. I'm not even sure I understand this comment, Jonathan. Funny because Calvinism is actually more internally consistent than Protestantism. Calvinism is Protestant. Yeah, I don't understand. It is a branch of uh, Protestantism. They would say we're the only real Protestants, some of them that are formed. But um, believe yeah, me, I I'm the I super find, chat. Tracker. I do find that it is internally consistent. I just don't find it consistent with scripture. So it's logically consistent in and of itself. It's just it has very little I don't to do so. with the Bible. If you want to know more, I, I think it's internet. implicitly contradictory. 
not explicitly. I think that once you start unpacking Calvinism, I think it leads to um, inconsistencies con- in the nature, in the of, nature God. of God. Yeah, yeah. But I, mean, I think as a system that doesn't caveat God being whatever you think causes the, you know, as a system, I think it is a, I think it is internally consistent, at least for the most part, in my opinion, it's just not biblical. That's all. Um, anyway, by the way, if you want to learn more about Calvinism, you can you can become a patron for a dollar, or if you want to actually learn a lot about a lot of different kinds of uh, soteriology and theology in general, you can actually consider becoming a student at Trinity College of the Bible and Theological Seminary, distance education at high quality that you can afford, taking courses from professors you've actually heard of before. So go to trinitysem.edu, that's trinitysem, S-E-M, dot E-D-U, and fill out what we call an evaluation form. It's free, and you can consider uh, looking around the websites, become a student, learn from professors like Braxton Hunter and uh, Leighton Flowers and Jim Chatham and Roy Harkness and Daphne Washington and myself and plenty of others. All right, and then when you get done with that, if you want to check us out at patreon.com slash Trinity Radio, there it is on the screen, and it's in the description. And um, listen, you'll get uh, lots of ebooks, including the audio book of Letters uh, from Ignorantia, and you'll also get uh, extra episodes, and you'll also get uh, a bunch Me of other ebooks. about Calvinism for... His for Calvinism become, series. Uh, a whole set, we've, you know, we've also talked a little yeah. bit about here about uh, interacting with atheists evangelistically, and I have a whole series on that. That is the newest thing I've done just for patrons, I think. Yeah. So lots of good stuff. All right. We love you all so much. I appreciate you all being here, whether you're an atheist, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, or whatever. Thank you all so much for being here and uh, hanging out with us. Here's some old time music for you. That is pretty song. I like that one. Yeah. Some people prefer the old song. Some people prefer honey. I'm still, uh, yeah, me and Rodney Tugger are still, you know, holding out for that to make a comeback all right this has been a blast thank you all so much and we will see you all next time we'll see you next time on trinity radio oh